Good evening. I think I'm the only person with a microphone who's going to actually fit because I'm so short. Glenn, it's not going to work for you. <laughs> uh, welcome to Dialogue and Democracy Rediscovering Civility in the Age of Hyperpartisanism or Partisanship. My name is Shawnee Prendergast, and I am the director of the Catholic Campus Ministry Program here at Montana Tech. This evening is a collaborative effort between the MTech Catholic Campus Ministry, the Department of Political Science here at Montana Tech, and the Foundation for the Diocese of Helena. Tonight we're going to hear two presentations, then we will have a panel discussion with a question and answer portion. I would like to point out two key points to the uh, media that we have put out. Um, how many have seen, have saw the poster that we had all over campus and in all the churches and everything? Um, I want to point out a couple things to you about that piece of media. The first thing is the poster had a word in there that was civility. And the second thing that I want to point out is that it also had a word, and both were in the title, and that word was dialogue. So if you put those two words together, we get a phrase. And the phrase is civil dialogue. We will be having a dialogue this evening focusing on being civil and treating each other and their opinions with respect. We believe the vast majority of the people here in the audience tonight are here to find a solution or a way to have a civil dialogue with other people, especially during the few, next few months to come. But then hopefully, we're going to give you some tools that you'll be able to have that dialogue civilly for years to come. This is a non-political, non-partisan event. During the question and answer portion of the evening, you may have the opportunity to ask a question or share a brief comment with the group around us. One more very important housekeeping thing before I get into the introductions is um, the location of the bathroom which should be the first thing I, that I said. The bathrooms are straight out the back door and um, on either side of the library doors. So now I would like to introduce to you our presenters and our panelists. <coughs> professor John Ray is a professor of political science at Montana Tech, and he has been here since 1975. He has a PhD in political theory from the University of Wisconsin, Madison, which in theory should make him a Green Bay Packer fan. Is that correct, John? No, well, we'll talk later. Um, he teaches classes in political theory, American government, public administration, and international relations. He is the chairperson of Citizens for Labor and Environmental Justice in Butte, and he is a native of New Iberia, Louisiana. Our second presenter tonight is Father Patrick Beretta. Father Patrick is the parish priest for St. Patrick and Immaculate Conception churches here in Butte. He serves as the chaplain of the Montana Tech Catholic Campus Ministry. He is a Veritas Forum Fellow. He was born in France, and he was ed educated in Europe. And that's all he would allow me to elaborate on. <laughs> Dr. Glenn Sutherville, PhD, serves as Associate Professor of Professional and Technical Communications at Montana Technological University, where he teaches courses in writing, interactive media, rhetorics, and serves in a variety of roles for the Montana Tech Faculty Association, the Montana Federation of Public Employees, and American Federation of Teachers. Dr. Sethergill's current research agenda focuses on software and code 
as sites of public intervention and reformation. Dr. Sethergill is married and has two young children. Author and award-winning journalist, Mr. David McCumber. Mr. McCumber is the editor of the Montana Standard and the regional editor for Lee Enterprises in Central Montana. Previously, he was the Washington Bureau Chief for Hearst Newspapers, managing editor of the Seattle Post Intelligencer, and Sunday editor, city editor, and assistant managing editor during his time at the San Francisco Examiner, and has been the newsroom leader of newspapers of almost all sizes. He has authored three nonfiction books, has served as the editor of two books that he did not write. Mr. McCumber was a finalist for a Pulitzer Prize in 1984. He and his wife, Sarah Green, have a son and a daughter. Mrs. Karen Burns is Butte native who attended local schools. She received her undergraduate degree in business from Montana Tech and her MBA from the University of Montana. She started her career in local government, working for the Butte Silver Bow Health Department. She is the director of, urban Re of the Urban Revitaliz Revitalization Agency and director of the Community Development Department. She is responsible for economic and community development for all of Silver Bow County. She volunteered with Big Brothers and Big Sisters for 13 years. She sits on the St. James Hospital Board, the Industrial Advisory Board for Montana Tech, the Headwaters RC&D Board of Directors, MADA Board of Directors. She enjoys running and cooking. Karen is married and the mother of a teenage son. Senator John Sesso is the current state senator for Senate District 37. The Senate Minority Leader, he is on the Finance and Claims Committee and the Long Range Planning Subcommittee. His in interim committee assignments are Finance, Water Policy, and Legislative Council. He was the state representative for House District 76 for four terms and served on the House Appropriations Committee, chairing the committee in the 2009 session, and was the House Minority Leader during the 2011 session. John also served as Butte Silver Bow's Planning Director for 26 years, and currently he is the Super Fund Coordinator for Butte Silver Bow. John has been married for 29 years to Barb Cornett, co-owner of the Uptown Cafe. And Mr. Matt Brower is, has served as the Executive Director of the Montana Catholic Conference since March 2014. He is a graduate of the University of Notre Dame and of the Ave Maria School of Law in Ann Arbor, Michigan. In 2007, he opened Brower Law Office in Whitefish, Montana, where he practiced law until accepting his current position with the Montana Catholic Conference. As executive director of the Montana Catholic Conference, Matt represents and assists both of the Roman Catholic bishops of Montana in matters of public policy and serves as the liaison for the bishops with state and federal government. In addition to his work at the Montana Catholic Conference, Matt also serves as a consultant to the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops Subcommittee on the Catholic Campaign for Human Development. Matt and his wife Miriam are the proud parents of two young girls. And at this time, I would like to give the floor to our speakers. First of all, Professor John Ray.
Thank you. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. This passage from Mark was the basis for Abraham Lincoln's speech in 1858, The House Divided, which was speaking about the divisions in the country between free and slave states, between freedom and slavery. Today, the division is not between North and South. It is not between slave or free. The division today is between warring parochial tribes, and it has been referred to as a cold civil war. Reason combats passion, dogmatism competes with compromise and consensus, moderation clashes with political excess, Uniformity and diversity are locked in combat. And these conflicting ideas and values permeate our national political life and represent a struggle, I would say, for the very soul of this nation. What I want to talk to you about tonight is the question of political civility in our country. I want to talk a little bit about what is the problem of political civility. Then I want to give a definition of what I mean by that term and what are the characteristics of civil discourse. I want to talk a little bit about the causes of political incivility and a little bit about how political civility and civil discourse relates to our fulfilling our responsibility as citizens. I want to talk a little bit about the concept of civic friendship, and I want to talk a little bit about how our political values and our political culture relate to civic friendship. Let me talk a little bit briefly about the extent of the political civility problem in this country. But in a sense, I don't even need to do that. Every time you turn on the news, you see political incivility in full display. We tend to characterize our political opponents as infidels, enemies, traitors. We don't listen to the other side, we attack them. We don't counter the arguments that others are making. We attack the person that is making the argument. We speak past our opponents. We don't speak to them. And civility is an important political value for this country because the lack of political civility makes democracy and public deliberation very difficult, if not impossible. Given that a major citizen function is to engage in public deliberation, political civility, by which I mean courtesy, self-constraint, empathy, tolerance of others with differing views, and respect for their right to speak because we value their human dignity, a willingness to consider the point of view of another person, all of these are important characteristics of citizenship and civic engagement. And I'll make the point over and over tonight that democratic decision making is impossible without political civility. The authors of a book called How Democracies Die said this, Yet we worry. American politicians now treat their rivals as enemies, intimidate the free press, 
and threaten to reject the results of elections. They try to weaken the institutional buffers of our democracy, including the courts, intelligence services, and ethics offices. The weakening of our democratic norms is rooted, the authors say, in extreme partisan polarization. And if one thing is clear from studying breakdowns throughout history, it is that extreme polarization kills democracies. When American democracy has worked, it has relied upon two norms that we often take for granted. Mutual toleration and institutional forbearance. Polls indicate that around 80% of Americans find the lack of civil discourse a major problem. So what is political civility? That's the variant of civility with which I am concerned this evening. In fact, civility has always had a political connotation. If you consider the definition of incivility, it comes from the Latin, incivilius, that means not a citizen. Going back to the thought of Aristotle, the relationship between politics and civility is well established. Political civility is applying the rules of ordinary civility to our political processes, and in particular, political discourse and deliberation. Political civility is expressed by means of civil discourse. I think the reason for the lack of efficaciousness in civ and civility in public discourse and decision making is that now public issues get framed in absolutist and in simplistic terms. Slogans and threats that assume the truth of one's position replace reasoned, nuanced thought about an issue. Too often advocates fail to remember Aristotle's admonition that you cannot look for the same degree of certainty in issues related to public policy that you expect in math or science. If certainty in the public realm were possible, there would be no need for public deliberation at all. Because we only deliberate about that which is uncertain so as to determine the best practical course of action. Public deliberation assumes contingency. If we knew with mathematical certainty what should be, for example, our health care policy, our immigration policy, our public financial policy, deliberation would be superfluous. If we knew with absolute certainty what is right in the public realm, we wouldn't need to deliberate about it. But the current political view is that if somebody disagrees, they must lack morals. And so we chastise them, and if needed, try to silence them. This is the deliberative process of the Inquisition, not of our representative democracy. But as I said, today all too often this deliberative situation is framed in terms that if you disagree with me, you're not just wrong, but you are morally wrong. It would be like accusing a student of moral impropriety or turpitude if they get the wrong answer to a math problem or question. Since compromising with evil is wrong, there will be no compromise. Often, this intolerance may be based in religion, in social or economic absolutism. But whatever the source, 
Seeing public issues in absolutist terms precludes meaningful public debate and discussion. I would argue that it is a basic premise of democracy that it is through the give and take of public debate and discussion that good public policy emerges and is created. And this premise works because political truth is the result of a dynamic dialectical process that does not seek to locate a fixed truth, as does, say, mathematics or science. But rather, it produces a probable, practical, political truth as a result of public deliberation. So now that we have perhaps some appreciation for the meaning of political civility, how can we recognize civil discourse? What are the characteristics of civil discourse? Well, I'll give you the characteristics fairly quickly. One is commonality. Trying to emphasize what unites us than what divides us. Deliberation, where you weigh and consider alternative courses of action and provide evidence and facts for your position. It is well said that truth precedes justice that we have to know what we're talking about before we can reach any conclusions as to what we should do. Inclusiveness, where everyone with a position is respected and included in the debate. This takes a certain humility. Provisionalism, that I may be wrong, but my perspective is this, and my perspective is this for these reasons. Listening to the other side, which doesn't mean hearing them, it means attaching meaning to what they say, and trying to learn and be open to other points of view. Well, why then is there so much incivility in our politics and discourse? In other words, what are some of the causes of political incivility? One of the major causes of incivility in our political process is inequality. Inequalities of power, inequalities of wealth, hierarchies of class, race, and gender. A feeling of powerlessness on the part of ordinary people. A feeling of alienation that the system does not respond to us that government doesn't really care about us. With all of these inequalities and lack of power, lack of ability to affect the outcome of political debate, people become frustrated. And when you get frustrated and you feel that nobody's listening, that government is not responsive, anger follows and gets directed against real, are imaginary enemies. Another big problem are special interest media, particularly cable media, where depending on the channel you, rock, you listen to or the radio program you listen to, you are bombarded every minute of the day with one political perspective, usually not framed with any reasoning behind it, but appeals to stereotypes, or appeal to dogmatic conclusions, and you get bombarded with that, and it's easy. You can then provide you with some slogans that you can use. In order to understand and reduce political incivility, we need to see that civility is an important part of citizenship. Citizenship is not just a legal classification. In his politics, Aristotle stated that a citizen is a person who enjoys the right of sharing in the deliberative and judicial function of the state. According to Aristotle, a good citizen had to display knowledge and capacity requisite for ruling as well as being ruled. And for Aristotle, a citizen was one 
who could act publicly on the basis of practical reason on matters of public interest. Much later, the French political theorist Jean Baudin, in his six books of the Commonwealth, defines citizens as individuals who set aside their private concerns and attend to public duties. Joint action, he said, is the essence of citizenship and demands that citizens deliberate together toward the common good. Echoing Baudin, the German philosopher Hegel argued that civic harmony occurs when private good gets identified with the common good. Whatever citizenship means, it involves meeting with others to share common concerns, exchange ideas, and make decisions about issues of concern to the community. The responsibility of a citizen includes our ethical obligation to respect the opinions of others and to participate in ongoing deliberation over matters of public importance. What I'm really saying is that political civility demands a return to what has been referred to in history as civic friendship. At this point, you may say, wait a minute, using the term friendship in our current politics? Come on, you know, this isn't Disney World. <laughs> While this may seem an un, or a totally unrealistic wish, totally fantastic, totally absurd, let's consider for a moment these words of Abraham Lincoln when the winds of secession fanned our nation cold in his first inaugural. Lincoln said, we are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic chords of memory will swell when again touched, as surely they will be by the better angels of our nature. These remarks were made even after seven states had seceded from the Union and only a little more than a month before the firing on Fort Sumter and the start of the American Civil War. Let me explain briefly what I mean by civic friendship and how it should be relevant for today's politics. I want to look first at Aristotle, because for both Plato and Aristotle, citizens must have a regard for one another. After all, for the Greeks, justice was a type of balance or harmony, and strife disturbed this balance. Civic friendship was a variant of the concept of friendship where people sought each other's benefit, displayed goodwill toward one another, displayed reciprocity, engaged in joint endeavors, trusted each other, and tried to help each other. A modern political philosopher, John Rawls, at Harvard University, emphasized this when he talked about civility in the political realm and civic friendship being based on reciprocity, listening, and giving public reasons, where you try to justify a position in political discourse by way of reasons that people of different moral or political backgrounds could accept. So much of our discourse today, if you really look at how people are arguing, are based on private reasoning without any attempt to provide any universality to their claims. Ralph Waldo Emerson, the great American transcendentalist, in his essay, on politics said that citizens should act toward one another much as friends do. And friends do not disagree in a manner that destroys the friendship. For Emerson, and Emerson, and this is important, 
friendship, civic friendship, does not demand unanimity or perfect harmony. And let me step back for a minute. I'm not saying today that conflict should disappear from politics. That is a totally unrealistic position. But it's how we conduct the conflict. It's how we conduct the disagreement. It's how we treat each other while we are disagreeing. Gramerson friendship demands following the norms of civility. It demands respecting the dignity of the other person. And that's where civility really comes down to. Do we respect the dignity of the other person? Or do we denigrate that dignity because of gender, race, class, whatever? Emerson said that if one knows what it means to be a good friend, one will also understand what it means to be a good citizen. Because the same norms for friendship work for citizenship. That we have to be concerned about the welfare of our friend. We focus on the other person and we tell the truth. As I'm sure you know from your personal experience, Lying destroys friendship. What's true in interpersonal relations is true in the public sphere. Habermas, another political theory of the 20th century, talked about ethics of democratic discourse, where you respect the freedom and equality of participants. You accept a diversity of perspective. The object is the public good, and so you listen to other people. You allow people to question, to exchange information. In summary then, what are the characteristics of civic friendship? Well, one, the voluntary exercise of moral will. We retain our self-interest, but we voluntarily recognize more general goods as necessary for and arising from political participation. Second, we pursue common goals. We are concerned about the common good. We are concerned about the well-being of others. Going back to Jean Baudin's concept of citizenship. Third, equal and respectful treatment of all, we respect differences. Next, we learn from others, we are honest in our dealings with others, and we're involved politically. Every country espouses a set of basic political values that are called our political culture. In America, I'll run them off very quickly. Liberty, equality, particularly equality of opportunity, democracy, unity, diversity, respect for diversity, civic duty. If we but reaffirm and embrace these values once again, it can provide a way out of the incivility in our country. These should inform the basic ends or goals of government. Let me give a brief quotation from How Democracies Die. The authors say egalitarianism, civility, sense of freedom, and shared purpose were the essence of mid 20th century American democracy. Today, that vision is under assault. To save our democracy, Americans need to restore the basic norms that once protected it. But we must do more than that. We must extend those norms through the whole of a diverse society. Now these norms must be made to work. That is our challenge. It is also our opportunity. If we need it, America will be truly exceptional. So in conclusion, it's obvious that our political system is not working well. If you go back and look at our Constitution, it mandates a political system and practice that is really based on the values of civility, civic friendship, compromise. Without political civility, our form of government does not 
function, and our democracy will surely die. Democracy depends on the people. After all, as Lincoln said, it is government of, by, and for the people. But if the people are verbally tearing each other apart, democracy cannot long endure. As Emerson said, could not a nation of friends even devise better ways? So I'd like to conclude with a quotation from Proverbs. After all, he that troubleth his own house shall inherit the wind. By a very fascinating twist of history, it took a passionate and stormy love story to bring the concept of civility to the English-speaking world. And it happened when King Henry II of England, who was also Duke of Normandy, fell in love with the formidable Eleanor of Aquitaine, uh, who was beautiful, she was brilliant, and she was ferociously ambitious. But she grew up in the most dazzling, sophisticated, refined court in Europe, and by far. It was the first court in Europe that practiced civility, and when she became Queen of England, she brought those values, those principles with her, and slowly introduced them to the anglo Normans. The word civility is a very old word. It comes from the 6th century Rome, right after the end of their monarchy, the beginning of the Republic, and it simply meant for them civility, the art of citizenship. And when the Renaissance thinkers, humanists, start to think, well, where does art of citizenship, where is it rooted? What is the basis for it? And they all came with the answer, it comes from human worth. It comes from human dignity. There's a Nigerian author, she's a contemporary author, a uh, brilliant lady, who says this about civility, and it could have been written by a Renaissance humanist. She says this, Civility is the recognition that all people have dignity that is inherent to their person, no matter their religion, race, gender, sexuality, or ability. Now, we have to be realistic. Um, Dr. Ray talked about Disney World. There has never been a golden age of political civility in our country or anywhere else. There's never been a time when everybody respected everybody else. They tried, but they always failed. Joanne Freeman, Freeman who is one of the great, great historians of this country, she says this, regional distrust, personal animosity, accusation, suspicion, implication and denouncement was the tenor of our national politics from the very beginning. So they disagreed a lot at the beginning of this nation and so they developed a way to disagree civilly and they, call, they called it the code of honor. You could disagree but you have to behave in a certain way when you expressed your disagreement. You couldn't be insulting, you could be inflammatory, you could not be lying. You would have to disagree in a moral way. Because civility is not about deluding your strongly held views. I have very passionate views, and that's not going to change. So civility is not, well, I'm going to dilute my views to make other people happy. No. Civility is about learning to respect that other people have different perspective and different views. Why? Because they have as much human dignity than you have. Now, we're in a position, political scientists say, that we are at a low point in our history when it comes to ability, but it's been much, much worse before. That, at least, is a little bit of an encouragement. <laughs> On the 22nd of May, 1856, a very, very famous incident on the floor of the Senate 
where Preston Brooks, from a senator from South Carolina, uh, in retaliation to an inflammatory speech by Charles Sumner of Massachusetts, attacked him. And he beat him up so badly that caused very, very severe brain damage and very, very nearly killed him. And the other senators tries to stop it, but one of his friends, another southerner senator, had a pistol preventing that anybody would stop the beating. At approximately the same time, on the floor of our House of Representatives, a giant, huge fist fight took place. And in the middle of the battle, one congressman lifted the hairpiece of another, lifted it like this, and somebody screamed, oh my god, the congressman has been scalped. <laughs> and that little bit of laughter put an end to, to the battle, but it got very, very ugly. So we're, never, we're nowhere near the national downslide sectarian divisions of the 1840s, 50s, and 60s, but the historian said, we are getting there. If we don't, if we're not careful, we are getting there. So today's the boundaries of civilities are increasingly ignored, and the honor code that was so precious to the beginning of our country is vanishing. We don't hear about it anymore. People don't care about insulting. People don't care about lying. And I don't think that anybody would be more devastated and saddened at what's happening in our country than the great George Washington, because he was a passionate believer in the genius of our country, which is uniformity, unity, and diversity. He said that we have so much in common in this country and he was worried, he was concerned about religious differences that were, that were extreme. He said, we have so much in common that there is never a reason not to cooperate and work with one another because we have a common philosophy and a common love of this country. Our system of government is entirely based on communication. That's what it's based on. So what happens when a country stops communicating. When factions, groups, parties stop having conversations and communicating to one another. What happens is that the two parties kind of drift further and further and further apart. When dialogue is no longer possible and they become irreconcilable. I'll give you some examples. I spent literally an entire year, 12 months, trying to understand the year 1793. It's an extraordinarily complex year. But it is the year when the French Revolution moved from ordered and reasonable to an all-devouring barbarity and terror. I spent almost a year trying to understand how a cultured and education, educated nation like Germany became infatuated with Nazism. Recently, I started looking again at how the Russian Empire collapsed into the sadistic purges of the Bolsheviks. These things happen. These things have happened. And I think it is very important to spend time to try to understand how did these things happen because they caused unimaginable suffering for a lot, a lot of people. And every time you look deeply at the root of these developments, you find the end of communications. And then people use violence as the only way to score any kind of victory. So let's look now very briefly at some examples in our country's history at examples of civility and lack of civility. One of the great achievements in this country in the 20th century is women's suffrage, the women getting the vote. And it took three generations of constant struggle for the women of this country to get the vote. And they were opposed at every juncture. And the reason why I have so much admiration for them 
is that their struggle remained civil and dignified and built on consensus. It surprises a lot of people, but the first party to embrace the cause of women's suffrage were the Republicans, and by far. But the women of the women's suffrage movement were not happy with one party support. They knew that was a was going to lead nowhere. They wanted consensus in both parties. That's what they wanted. And that is what they got. Because in the history of our republic, all the great and lasting achievements have required coalitions and consensus building and civility. And whatever in the history of our republic has been based on partisanship and without consensus building and civility has never lasted. The great danger for a cause to be associated with a partisan position because the fortunes of that position, of that party, from this depends the fortunes of your cause. And some causes, like women's voting, are much, much too great and important to belong to only one party. Let's look at another example briefly. The time after the Civil War, healing of the wounds, Lincoln versus Johnson, Dr. Ray already mentioned, the immortal words of Jesus used by Jesus, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Lincoln was deeply disturbed by the divisions of the country at his time. And his great genius, his incomparable brilliance, was to say, this is unacceptable. That has nothing to do with the American identity. That is not us. And he talked about his presidency at a second revolution to restore an ethics of civility and tolerance. The words that he used are beautiful. They were used by Dr. Ray. Bringing the people back to its better angels. And the great, great president was about to complete the second revolution when he was murdered. So for his vision of national reunion, healing after the great civil war, Lincoln had in his mind very lenient, generous terms for the South. But he was opposed by the radicals of his own party who wanted blood. They wanted revenge. That civil war had been incredibly painful. They didn't want to allow the, the South to be allowed to, to restore itself, I mean, quickly and easily. They wanted to weaken the states. They wanted to increase the power of federal courts. And the great brilliance and genius of Lincoln is that, that he had to wait. He couldn't rush this thing. And he started slowly to work on a coalition on a consensus on working together, a dialogue between the radicals of his own party and the Southerners. And he was in the process of doing that when he died. He was replaced by his vice president, Andrew Johnson. He was a completely different man. He was considerably less brilliant. He was antagonistic. He was authoritarian. Uh, he was uncivil. And he was uh, in many ways very confrontational. And so he went to war against the radical Republicans of the party of Lincoln. And war began between them and the president because the Congress at that time was just as uncivil. And what they did is that they passed a lot of laws very quickly to restrict the power of the presidency. And then they caught him violating these new laws and the House impeached him. And he survived the um, vote in the Senate. He was acquitted by just one vote. But the great, great tragedy of the presidency, the murder of Lincoln and the presidency of Johnson, is that his intolerance, his incivility, his confrontational style polarized the country when he needed to heal. And he pushed people to further and further extreme. And so the wounds of the Civil War lasted as long as they did, decades, decades, 
because of his inability to be a healer the way Lincoln had planned to be. Second great contrast, and I find this fascinating, the way this country dealt with the after World War. Wilson versus Truman and Eisenhower. Woodrow Wilson was a much more effective uh, at winning the war than he was at winning the peace. Because he was also, in many ways, very, very intolerant of dissenting views. And he had a special idea about the, his peace plan, his famous 14 points. And he was absolutely incapable of considering compromise with the Senate. And so they fought and they beat him. They defeated his peace plan, which means that in the 1920s and 1930s, when Europe kind of devolved more and more towards fascism and the horror of Nazism, America was not involved in that in a way that I think could have made an enormous difference for the future of Europe. Let's look at Truman in comparison. After this country won the Second World War, he worked very hard on compromise to get the support of Congress from his party and the other party for his peace plan, the famous Marshall Plan. He writes, uh, Harry Truman, in all the history of the world, we are the first great nation to feed and support and build the conquered. And so in sharp contrast to the incredible bitterness that followed the First World War, the Marshall Plan, the Peace Plan of Harry Truman, brought forgiveness and healing and reconstruction at an unimaginable pace. France and Germany became friends after those centuries of warfare in practically no time as a result of the Marshall Plan. And all this did not happen um, with Wilson. Because the style of Truman was a style of leadership that was subtle, respectful, optimistic, and honest. Wilson was never considered to be honest. Truman was perceived to be a very honest president. And he never criticized an opponent by name. Think about that. He never attacked a, an opponent by name. And he was the first one to include different wings in his party, a little bit like Lincoln and the team of, uh, of rivals. He had his isolationist, the isolationist Americans and internationalist Americans in his government. He wanted both of them at the table to have a conversation. And he's the first president to develop a liaison director with Congress. Uh, I think Harry Truman's presidency is underappreciated. So the miracle of this country, the genius of this country, that when the time is most needed, this country has always produced a leader like Washington and Lincoln and Roosevelt and Truman and Eisenhower and Martin Luther King and many, many others. This country, when it was most needed, that's the miracle of this country, has always produced a leader to bring back the country to civility and coalition building and inclusiveness. In the history of our country, all the great leaders, when history looks at our history, all the great leaders have invariably been inclusive and unifiers and mediators. And that's a rule that you can hold as firm. Those are the people that are considered on the hindsight of history to be great leaders. And that's true of community and it's true of local. Something interesting. What do Abraham Lincoln and Martin Luther King have in common? Different centuries, different race, different culture, different education. But they have this in common. They are both transformational figures. They both have the same vision of America. They both embody a leadership that is consistent because of its tolerance and civility with the founding of the nation. They both spoke in striking biblical language, both of them and they were both assassinated. Think about that. Think about that. So in this time of late modernity, 
it seems that societies and politics goes through more civil, less civil. We get closer to it, and then we lose it, and it has to be restored, and it seems to be this cycle. Lincoln, when he was faced with the division of his country, he says this, and I think that's incredibly powerful because it resonates today like nothing else. He says, we cannot escape history. It's not possible. The fiery trial through which we pass will light us down in honor or dishonor to the latest generations. He's talking to us. Our greatest president is talking to us. He says, you're challenged by something that is a great threat to this country, which is your divisiveness. And the way you deal with it, because you don't have the luxury to be mere spectators, the way you deal with it will define you and will light you in honor or dishonor. I'm a great, great admirer of the Irish poet William Butler Yeats and Yeats, and if there is something that wonderful poet knew is division because of the Ireland of his time. And he has haunting words that are so stunningly current about division. And he says this, he could have spoken about our country. He wrote this, things are falling apart. The center cannot hold. Everywhere, the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, convictions, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. That's an incredible line. The worst, the best lack all convictions, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. And then he concludes, surely some revelation is at hand. Revelation is indeed at hand, and it is now in the hands of our panel. <laughs> the way we we're planning on doing this is that each member of the panel uh, has been asked to give no more than um, a two minute set of their views on this topic of political civility. And then we're going to have some, or I'll pose some questions to them uh, related to the nature and extent of political incivility. And perhaps most importantly, what, are, what, what would they recommend that we might be able to do uh, to help lessen this political incivility? So Matt, I'll start with you here. Thank you, Professor. Hello? Okay. Well, thank you, first of all, to all of you for being here. To those who live closer to the mic, please. Is that a little better? No. no I don't on. think it's on. Oh, okay, there's this one. Is. <laughs> um, thank you, Father and, and Dr. Ray and Montana Tech, Department of Political Science and campus ministry for putting together this evening um, for what I consider to be a very timely and urgently needed event. I want to talk a little bit about the actual format here and why this is so important. Events like ours tonight are a small but significant part of the remedy for the toxic situation we're currently witnessing in the state of our political discourse within this country. The value of an event such as this is not so much in the specific insights shared or positions espoused, though that content is no doubt very valuable and important. But rather, I think the greatest impact of a forum of dialogue is what a gathering and conversation of this type models for broader society. The value of tonight is less about what we are saying and more about what we are doing. I recently had a conversation with a leader at another Montana college, and we were discussing have some, some type of forum event or panel discussion surrounding a very divisive issue. It was a, a moral, social topic that, that people are deeply divided on. He said that he would eagerly embrace the opportunity to have a panel discussion made up of participants with differing viewpoints who could carry on a civil and productive conversation. 
people who are colleagues and friends, but who disagree about specifics related to this particular moral issue. He explained to me that in his experience, that type of civil discussion and deliberative dialogue is virtually non-existent and foreign to the experiences of many of the students, especially when it comes to a divisive issue. Methods of communication and engagement that many of us may take for granted as being the most productive and healthy for our pluralistic society may not be universally or even widely accepted anymore. An event like this one tonight offers an opportunity to demonstrate that honest, fruitful dialogue marked by intelligibility, charity, confidence, and deferential sensitivity provides us with a better path forward. So I thank you all for being here and being part of this. David Obina. Well said. Good evening and thank you to Montana Tech. Thank you to Father Beretta uh, for thinking of, of me and what I do uh, when, a, when you assemble this panel. I really appreciate that. I'm honored to be able to be here to listen and to hopefully contribute. At the Montana Standard and at other newspapers, particularly community newspapers, there's a strong sense of responsibility to lead in the area of civility. We take our role as a community forum, seriously, we want to start and facilitate conversations that have an impact on decisions that will shape youth's future. We believe it is absolutely essential to conduct those conversations in an atmosphere of civility. We try to set the tone for that. And that's why uh, a few years ago, we took steps to eliminate anonymous commenting on our website that effort has changed the tone of our site. It's not perfect. Aliases still crop up, though we police them. But it's way better, enough to allow people to focus on the merits of the issues rather than the viciousness of the invective. And I think that's what happens when people stand behind what they say, put their names, attach their names to it. Still, I am hugely concerned with the overall level of incivility with which we're constantly confronted currently in this country. That, and I'm gonna talk about slaying the messenger because I think it's important. That it unfortunately includes <laughs> abuse aimed at journalists themselves. It has suddenly become acceptable, if not fashionable, among some to threaten journalists with physical harm. Let me give you a little context. This year, worldwide, 42 journalists have been killed, not in accidents or by being confused for combatants, but precisely because of their journalism. And in case you think that's an anomaly, a really bad year like a hurricane season, you should know that from 1992 through this year, 1,321 journalists have lost their lives because of their profession, because what they did represented a direct threat to forces, including governments, which had the power to end their lives. And across the globe, impunity for killing journalists is running at over 90%. So in this context, the phrase enemy of the people resonates. It carries the power to enable and encourage those who would consider such violence. Certainly threats of violence against journalists in this country have increased sharply. We were horrified along with the rest of the country one of the Capitol Gazette in Annapolis, Maryland this year, a man enraged by accurate coverage of his career as an abuser and stalker shot five journalists to death. And we get threats right here of varying intensity. A journalist in our Helena newsroom this year was left a terrifying telephone message uh, that included the phrase, I'd like you to be set on fire and see how you like that. She's no longer in the profession. But I would just, in closing, we want to stress that we in journalism are not the enemy of the people. We are an essential part of democracy. And we dedicate our careers to making other people better citizens by informing them. We welcome opinions of every ideological stripe on our editorial pages. And we believe that if we can all keep this conversation civil, there's no limit to the progress we can make together in view. Thank you. Thank you, David. Sharon? 
Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Father Beretta and uh, Professor Ray, for inviting me to be a part of this panel. Um, I'm not sure which one I was on the poster in terms of the voter, the, <laughs> the whatever, but um, I, I bring to this um, discussion tonight, I think what I feel in terms of civil dialogue and what's most important to have that be productive, and I don't know why I'm getting feedback. You guys hearing that? No, it was, it's whining up here pretty loudly. Um, but what I want to talk about is the human content of a civil dialogue. I feel like in today's world, the way that we communicate with each other has lost a human function. I feel like we are able to communicate with each other very, very quickly without any human touch to that. There are words on a page, um, text messages, social media, emails, and the very nature of that communication, the way those come across, allows us to communicate with each other in an uncivil way without any, uh, any, uh, I've got the wrong word, we have no, uh, we have no uh, buy-in to that. And so it comes at us from all different directions and there are no consequences to sending that message immediately. Because you don't see the person who reads it. You don't see their reaction. So there's no human element to this. And to me, that is part of the biggest problem with incivility in all of our discussions that we have, political or otherwise, in our ways that we communicate in this country. Um, an example that I am experiencing right now myself is I am receiving a lot of incivil <laughs> messages from folks that don't see the effect of their inhumanity. They don't understand that there's a human on the other end of that. And, and I think that that touches on exactly what my other panelists have just said, um, saying it in a much more simplistic manner. But I think that the, the way that we fix this, the way, where we start, starts with ourselves, starts with how we communicate, we take it upon ourselves to communicate with each other on any issue whatsoever as human beings first, with respect and knowing that we create a culture of this human acceptance in our homes, in our workplaces, with our neighbors, and with our families. And we have to start to breed that ourselves. It doesn't come down from anyone else. We have to start with us in our own little circle and hope that that spreads and know that it will if we continue on that path. And if you have a passion about something, if you are really passionate about something, please be respectful in how you convey that passion. Just being loud doesn't mean you're correct. So realizing how you communicate with others and bringing it down to that human level, I believe is the most important thing that you can do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Uh, Brian Sin. <laughs> hey, uh, thank you, Dr. Ray. Uh, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here as a statesman on the panel and sharing a couple of my uh, perspectives uh, from my career now. Uh, I'm starting my le last uh, session and in the middle of my last term as a uh, legislator that has had the privilege of serving all of you in, in Butte for what will be 16 years. And um, I have seen uh, the best and now the worst of uh, public discourse and incivility. Uh, I, I, I was able to come into the legislature after, you know, 20 years of working for Butte Silver Bowl as the planning director and every day being a uh, tie-breaking uh, uh, exercise in helping people get along, uh, working out differences between neighbors, uh, differences uh, between zones, etc., and a, a great, a great opportunity to learn how uh, to bring compromise to every problem that uh, we face. 
in our everyday lives. When I went to the legislature, my first term uh, in the House of Representatives, there were 50 Republicans and 50 Democrats. And I, I thought that was the way it was going to be all the time. And you could not pass one bill unless you reached across the aisle and got the cooperation of the other side, whether, depending on whichever other side of the aisle you were on, you had to work with each other to pass anything. And then the next session, and as I said, I, I, I was taught by some of the best statesmen uh, that Butte sent to the legislature, and they uh, coached me up on how to be bipartisan, nonpartisan, to be a compromiser, and uh, I brought those uh, intentions, and they were all on display in that first session. In the next session, one seat changed. It went from 50-50 to 50 to 49 to one, constitutionalist from, from Lake County, and it was like the, the, a completely different place because of one vote and the perception that you didn't need to work together and be respectful and be civil and all of the things that have been said already tonight. And then in 2009, back to 50-50. And back to the civility, back to the respect, and back to the necessity to have to work with each other and build relationships. And then 2010, the elections of 2010, and what was the first election that was held in this country and in Montana in the post-Citizens United court case, which allowed citizens or corporations to donate money to campaigns, and uh, the onslaught of what we call uh, uh, dark money, where organizations have gone to extraordinary lengths to hide who's providing the dollars behind the message. And so, in my introductory remarks, I wanted to draw attention to two things. The per pervasive, insidious onslaught of dark money in politics, which I think you could draw a direct line from it to incivility in our leaders and our politicians. And two, of all the good that has come to society with the World Wide Web, it has had a chilling effect on civility. Why? For, for two reasons. One is the instantaneous dissemination of human mistake. In, in the old days, in, in my first term, I, I heard him talking to a man who went to the legislature in 2005 and was told to bring a cell phone. I, I did not have one before I became a legislator. And when I got there, I was told I had to get on social media to be an effective statesman. And I have not yet and intend to conclude my career without being on Facebook. <laughs> I wanted to make is we're all human and we make mistakes and sometimes say things without thinking and it used to be you could take a pause somebody slapped you around and you said hey I'm sorry I meant to say and then repeat what you would have, should have said the first time but in the world today your mistake your outburst, your thought without thinking, is across the nation before you're done saying it. You, you, you are already gone viral, as, as they say, and it breeds the discontent in your adversary to the point where they feel they have to respond and things become uncivil. And, and the second part of it is this web has given, given a forum to 
the blogger, the self-anointed expert, and as was stated earlier, the, the, this instance where you can live in a, in a bubble and only listen to the people that you agree with and then get all of your information all day long from people that you agree with and never hear the other side and unfortunately never hear the facts of whatever topic is on the table that day. And as a person in office, when before you're taking a vote and you get literally a thousand emails, you know, 400 on one side and 300 on the other side and 300 more that are just complaining that you have to vote at all. <laughs> and this distracting the political process to the point of, of, of crippling, crippling the way we're supposed to make decisions based on reason, based on arguments, based on confronting your critic who has a, every side, every, excuse me, every issue has two sides. As a statesman and, and as an elected official, it's your job to sort out the right, what's factual, what's not, how it affects your constituency, and it's all distracted because of this pervasive internet and the social media that comes with it. I think we should explore that a little more tonight. Those are some of my opening remarks. Again, thank you for letting me part of the, of, of the panel. Thank you, John. And finally, John. Okay, well, for starters, good evening. I'd like to thank uh, Father Beretta as well as uh, Professor Ray for your very generous invitation to be a part of a, a, a highly esteemed panel. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm more than slightly intimidated to speak at this very moment. And uh, thank you to my panelists for your insights and remarks. But most importantly, I'd like to thank all of you for being here tonight. To I personally think you deserve more applause than that, but that's just my two cents. <laughs> uh, to give up your time to be a part of this discussion that uh, needs to take place. The critic and theorist Kenneth Burke's famous parlor metaphor discusses a never-ending, heated conversation. You enter it by listening and then offering a response. Some agree with your statements and align themselves with your position. Others don't. They dissent and line up against what you have to say. The conversation changes course and it does continue past your departure. My fellow rhetoric citizen scholars and I may hang our hats on the skills inherent to Burke's metaphor, such as close listening, the ability to persuade, and the ability to be persuaded. We may also now wonder the degree to which those skills are viewed as integral to citizenry and civility today. But that's really not good enough. What about privilege, which grants some groups greater access or agency? What of corporate actors, such as so-called dark money political action committees? Their deep pockets almost entirely fund negative advertising that have the uh, impact of diminishing the public trust in our political processes. Civility can be understood as an application of commonly accepted social norms, but what if when those norms themselves become unjust, damaging, or exclusionary? I speak of a need for civil criticism when warranted. Perhaps counterintuitively, partisanship may also prove somewhat beneficial. Bringing opposing points of view into conflict can create stronger answers or defeat weaker ones. Collective activism may influence government in ways that individuals cannot. Political parties, as they attract independent and younger voters, also may lead more people into civic life. As we work to recover civility as an applied virtue, which we are and we should, so too may we discuss reframing partisanship in productive ways. The two actions seem interconnected, but neither task is an easy one. In much the same way that I believe partisanship can be salvaged, I fear civility can become damaging if not approached deliberatively. And I welcome your questions and again offer my thanks. Thank you. 
we had formulated some questions that I'm going to throw out to the panel, and um, I'll ask whoever would like to respond, please respond, and if you don't respond, I'll call on you. <laughs> if, if you could respond briefly, so that everybody's time yeah, to speak. Yeah, um, because we have about 40 minutes left. Uh, agendas are sort of covenants with the audience that will end on time. <laughs> I don't want to break a covenant. The first question, and some of you have touched upon this already, is how big a problem uh, is political incivility today? Um, and have you seen incivility increase uh, in your experience? But also, do you see any positive changes in the level of incivility? Well, I'll just say quickly, I think it's a huge problem. Um, and I think it, it reflects a false picture of America. You know, we're, we're increasingly polarized and driven to the margins. And, and yet, is that where people live? Are people really all extremists of one stripe or the other? No, I think most of us are pretty close to the middle of the, of the ideological divide that we seem to have. But a couple of things I want to mention as causes of that. One is the preaching to the choir media, which has been talked about uh, here, which I think is just an enormously destructive force. You know, we talk about um, the radicalization of young Muslims on the internet. Frankly, we should be talking more about the radicalizations of old Americans on the internet, you know, uh, and, with, and with cable TV. I mean, it, it's really a huge issue. I, I also think that our, in our political process, I think gerrymandering has had a huge effect because when you pack all of your uh, opponents or perceived opponents in, in as few districts as possible and then make your own districts as, as unchallengeable as possible, a bunch of things happen. One is your only threat then becomes from the, comes from the margins, comes from somebody who feels more strongly that, and fur, further out there than you do. And so you drift in that direction, whether it's left or right. And, and I think that's really corrupted the conversation in Congress. So I think it's a huge problem. I think there are things that we can do about it. I hope our absolutely apolitical Supreme Court can take care of gerrymandering for us. I, I have, I've seen it increase dramatically in, in between 20, 2009 when we had a 50-50 session and then we had the Tea Party uh, uh, movement and, and the dark money piece uh, and, and the 2010 elections and then the people who came to the legislature in 2011 incidentally went from 50-50 uh, to 68 to 32 in the House of Representatives. And many of the newly elected folks thought that they were there to just state their ideology. Just to state what those limited number of people uh, thought, and that's it. Not to come and deliberate. Not to come and be statesmen. Not to come and, and, and honor the ethical obligation to be civil in in those bodies. Instead, it was speech after speech of what they personally believed. And that's it. No conclusion, so therefore, I think we ought to do this. They just ended the speech with what they believed. And since that low point in the Montana legislature to today, I, I think it has gotten better. Uh, I think that, the, that we saw how ridiculous that was, and we built the coalition of the middle uh, so that if, if you were moderate in your views and you were willing to build a relationship with people based on who they were rather than what their background or what political party they were from, you really had a, uh, a, a, a good, good shot at, at getting things done. And if you focused on the work, and you focused on listening, as was stated earlier, and less about what your core belief was and more about the issue at hand that you were trying to solve, that that's the way the system was supposed to work. And so 
it, it, in my career, it was as civil and respectful and relationship building as could possibly be for the first three terms. And then 11 and 13 were, were really low points. And now we're building back up to uh, relying on those relationships to get good work done in a bipartisan way. So I think it's a big problem. Uh, I think that we, we, as citizens, we have to state our objection. Corporations are simply not people. And they have too much power to run our elections. We learned this in Butte, Montana in 1904, that you can't buy your way to an election. And if we don't change it, we're in for a long tenure of bad politics for the long term. It, We've got to change that. We've got to stand up and say, no, let's put it back the way it was. It worked pretty darn good when you could put a contribution in the mail to your friend who you supported. It was reported. That's how it worked. Everybody knew who their, their proponents were and their opponents, but it was all out in the open. We've got to get back to that world, and we've got to do it soon. The, the last part of the question about positive changes, the short answer for me is no. I think, I think in the short time I've had my position, I've seen things get worse, um, particularly I'd say even within the last 24 months, two years or so. But the one thing that I have noticed is given this increasing level of incivility, one thing that gives me hope is even in the midst of that, there are numerous people, most people I would say, who when they're engaged, engage in a civil way. And the key thing there, I think, is that when they do so, as the level of incivility increases, they're risking more. There's more on the line when they behave as respectful people should, because then they become a target. They're somebody who doesn't care, they're not passionate enough, um, it's not something they really care about. And so their reputation ends up being put on the line when they behave in a way that is civil because that escalating level of incivility actually makes them a target. On this important question, on this important question, I'd like to respectfully yield my time to Karen. <laughs> That's artful. That was very civil. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so, just briefly touch on um, the question. I, I do think that it's a huge problem um, today, and I have seen an increase in my little corner of the world um, greatly in the last uh, two years, for sure. Um, and I think that that goes back to um, people who like to uh, engage with you only through certain means, um, a lot of times unhuman means, like we talked, like I talked about in my beginning, and I think others have touched on that. And they feel powerful when they do that. They feel like they are getting their point across and they're pushing it out there. And what I've found um, a little bit of positiveness is uh, sometimes when you try to engage with those folks on a human level, you ask them to have a conversation with you in person or on the phone, and you're able to talk with them and listen to what their the true issue is, and kind of come to some sort of compromise, you can make some headway. Now that's very small <laughs> compared to some of these larger things we're talking about, but if we all start to do business that way, one step at a time, we might knock it like, down on it a little bit and um, stop the, the madness, so to speak. Um, but yes, I do think it's a huge problem. We have seen a huge increase, but I have some hope. We've also touched on this question, but maybe we can get into it in a little greater depth. Why is incivility, political incivility, incivility in discourse and dialogue so harmful to our political system? in this country. Uh, Dr. Ray, I, I, my, my prepared answer uh, to that question was 
the harm is that when people are not civil, there is in fact less dialogue. There, you, you just don't bother. And so what you miss is there's less debate, there's less spirited and earnest discussion of the exchange of arguments, which leads to solutions. You, you, you know, you, you gotta have the debate. You gotta have people bringing the best of their side of the story to the table and let it test, let it be tested. It has to be challenged. Any good idea has to be challenged for it to be a sustainable idea. And when people aren't civil with each other, they just don't bother talking. And so a lot of great input that you would otherwise have in the debate isn't there. So, you know, you, some wise guy, an uncivil statement is made, and then everybody just blows them off. But the other people that are interested in actually getting work done, they go into the back room and, and figure it out. They don't bother having the public uh, discussion in front of everybody, so everybody understands where everybody's coming from and that what led to that decision. So the biggest challenge, or the biggest uh, 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 threat, why it's so harmful, is because it leads to less debate, which is the hallmark of our democratic process. Yeah, I, I think it jeopardizes the very integrity of the process and that trust that, that the citizenry must have in that process that's eroded. People say there is no process. It's just who yells louder, more often, and to the right people. And so it, it, the, that, that faith we have to have, that this is how we come to make decisions, it's gone, it evaporates. The other very real way I think it uh, is harmful is that it may prevent the next John Sesso from running. You know, it may prevent the, the best people uh, to, to step forward. Who wants to put themselves in the public forum today and make, make yourself vulnerable to that kind of invective, that kind of pain? And so I, I, I think that that's a, a real danger and, and something that, that doesn't get talked about enough. Can I just say ditto and pass it to Glenn? <laughs> he did it to you. <laughs> well, what goes around comes around. Uh, to the panel, I would add uh, the following consideration. I think we have begun to develop a very impoverished sense of argument as a means of growth, of learning, and standing on a common basis that which unites uh, is not agreement, but rather our ability to commit ourselves to a higher word of ideal. Uh, and to recognize that argument as a, a process of discerning and understanding truth as best as possible uh, requires us to put ourselves out there. It requires ourselves to be put into a subject position of vulnerability. It requires ourselves to be uh, willing to be wrong and, and, and understand that in being wrong, we move us collectively towards the right. Uh, and at the moment, uh, I think our understanding of argumentation is a whack-a-mole, defeat, win, by any means. That's what we are expected to do uh, when we quote unquote argue. Uh, so I think incivility has given us a really impoverished sense of dialogue. Uh, and that to me is, I think, the greatest threat. Thank you. What do you think, and again, we've touched on this, but we can get into it in a little greater depth, the causes of so much political incivility? Well, we, I think we have uh, hit on it. Uh, my, my view is I, I think that this dark money, and, and uh, it, it's a cause. I think there is a direct correlation between that law being changed and uh, the, the people who then conclude that it's okay to be on, on Um I, I think that also the, the social media piece and I think Karen touched on it, the inhumane aspects of, of you know, 40 characters and sound bites replacing reasoned arguments 
is a big deal. It, it, it's, a, I think, a, a cause that leads to this political instability because he, you, know, you can be a lot you know, more of a jerk when you don't have to look the person in the eye and, 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 and really respond to their human emotion. You can just you know, call them what you want on some platform uh, whether you're, you're, you know, on one of these talk shows or, or, or what have you, when you don't have a, a real interaction with people. And I think that's missing. That's, that's missing in our society today. You, we've all kid about it with, with the children who are sitting at the, the, uh, the uh, table in a restaurant and they're texting each other at the same table. I mean, this has got to get changed somehow. The, the, the idea that we've got to bring human interaction back into debate and, and, and it, into political discourse, I think that's a cause as well. I, I guess I would add that I think incivility is not just a, a problem in political discourse, but it's a social problem. And civility and incivility is learned first in the home and in the family. And so I think we have to look at what's going on in families to see, you know, the fabric of the family is being torn apart, has been for decades. And that doesn't mean everyone who's coming out of that environment is going to behave in a, a manner that's incivil, uncivil. Um, but I think that this is something that, that originates outside of politics. And, and this is, you know, we talk about the social media and all those pieces and, and the problem there. There's fertile soil for people to start behaving that way when they enter into a forum like that. There's something that's already been learned, or perhaps not learned. Maybe it's not they're taught incivilly. Maybe they don't ever learn how to be civil. Um, I don't know. I, I think it's, it's a, more of a social problem than just a political issue. Political problem. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
I'm going to share very quickly, following up with John's case, about three semesters ago, I had a student who was addicted to gaming to the point where she missed a speech because she was up until four in the morning gaming. And she came up to me uh, at, in another class after it was over and said, Dr. Ray, Dr. Ray, I, I've got a problem. I've got to talk to you about this problem. I don't know what to do. And I didn't know. You know I thought it might have been, who knows. She said, I've been invited out on a date. Do you think I'll have to talk to him? <laughs> and I said, well, and I was being facetious. I said, well, maybe you could just sit there and text each other. And she said, do you think that would work? Do you think that would work? The final question that I wanted to get to is, what can citizens do to improve the level of incivility uh, in terms of our political dialogue? Uh, should people feel powerless, or should we feel empowered that we can bring about uh, a change, that we can improve uh, the level of civil discourse and decrease the level of incivility? In short, what can individuals do? I want to hark back to what Karen said a while ago, that it's really, this is human to human, individual to individual, it's, it's taking care of what we do and being mindful of the way we interact with people on, on a personal basis. That's, that's the only solution for this, ultimately, I, I, I think. Uh, we've just got to get back to understanding the value of being nice to each other. And just, just quickly on that, um, we try to, in our, our own little corner of the world, of my neighborhood, my family, my friends, my work, we, we try to have a motto of, we have a sign in our office that says, because nice matters. Because it does. It truly matters. And it truly matters how you treat one another, regardless of beliefs. We went through all the differences we have as people in this world. But just try to be nice to each other. I know that sounds kind of hokey, but you're, you have the power to do that, and you have the power to have human interaction, and you have the power to spread that to everyone that you know and ask them to do the same. I, I would say also that uh, no one person in the room is more or less powerful to, to do something about this. Um, we may be uh, in positions that give us more uh, opportunity to, to try to do something about it, and we're on the, the uh, docket more, and we have to speak in public more, etc. But it, everyone is part of the problem. It, it, everyone there before is part of the solution. We, we all have to make an effort and it, in my world, there, what, what I've seen over my career as a, um, a public service guy uh, for the local government and now as a statesman in the legislature is that there is a declining respect for public service. That there's a, a declining trust in our government institutions uh, and we got to all work to rebuild that trust and that respect because uh, you know I work with people every day they're working hard to, to make good decisions and to serve the public and to serve the people and uh, uh, we, 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 we've got to we, we, we just have to do our best to, to, to improve that attitude about our, our government because it's, it's, it's having an effect uh, good good people are shying away from public service, and that that's not good for for our country, our our state, or our community of view. And uh, I would just appeal to everybody that we we can the power of the people is 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 here, and we can do uh, a lot about it. And uh, I, I would just make that appeal. Montana on the dark money piece, you know, we're on the right track. We, we passed a good law in '15. Uh, to try to bring some sunshine to at least work, who's given the money and, and uh, 
what organizations are doing that. We're a national model in that regard. And uh, I think if we can just keep the, the push on to uh, put things back the way they were uh, on the lessons we already learned in Butte uh, from the Copper Kings, I think that's another thing we can do. And, and we've got a lot of power to try to get that done. I started earlier on by uh, complimenting all of you as the audience for being here tonight. And what I think I neglected to say as I intended in this question to, to give each of you a, a homework assignment. Uh, so I hope you'll, you'll pardon me for, for staying true to my professorial roots. Uh, there are three parts to this homework assignment and no extra credit will be given, no extension will be given. I won't tolerate any top breaks from the syllabus in this regard. The first of which is to situate the subject of our conversation, civility, uh, within a framework of reason. And specifically, I'd say, think about your duty to posterity, think about your duty to our shared space, our community, and our country. Uh, the second would be consequence. Uh, what are the implications of what you say and what you don't say? Bear that in mind. The first homework assignment is to find someone like you in a close affiliation and respectfully challenge their thinking in a way that it needs to be challenged. Uh, for example, uh, young men, when next you encounter a, a male friend, speak of a woman in a disrespectful way, please call them out. You as their friend are in a unique position of trust to help elevate their thinking. They may not like you at the moment, but you're doing them a favor. So find that like-minded person and be willing to challenge and point out that you're doing it not to harm them, but to make them better. And in so doing, grow yourself. Now here's the tough one. Think about someone you have nothing in common with. Nothing. Seek them out and listen. Hear their story. Hear what they have to say. You share the same space. You share the same human dignity. Please do these two things. And again, thank you, and God bless you. I guess a, a couple things I would re repeat to myself frequently, the golden rule. I think a lot of this boils down to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Uh, it's a good mantra to live by. Um, the other thing, interestingly, being one who works in the policy arena, but within the church, for the church, the Catholic Church, uh, I was at a talk not long ago where we had a speaker and a well-known evangelical speaking to a bunch of Catholic lobbyists, and he said, the interesting thing is, part of our work is to remind the people that we work with that politics is not the most important thing. And so I think keeping a proper perspective on, on what the political discourse is, what the ends of that are, how important that is, and have, have that properly prioritized in your life, because I think we have people kind of falling too, too often into two camps. The one that says, I don't want anything to do with politics, I'm not interested in it or any of those issues, it's ugly, it's, um, it's angry, it's not something I'm interested in, so they disregard it. And those who elevate it above all else, and everything depends on their politics and what's going to happen in this election and what's gonna happen on this bill, that's not a properly ordered perspective and priority for addressing big issues in life. So I think that's, it's good to kind of reassess where we're at, where, where is our political engagement in terms of our energies and our heart, where are we at? And I think reflecting on that frequently can be helpful. Thank you. I think that will conclude the panel part of this evening. I'm gonna turn it over to Father Barretta in a moment, who will wrap things up. But I want to thank members of the members of the panel for a really engaging uh, discussion tonight with some excellent points. And thank you so much for, for coming. I really appreciate it. And thanks to all of you for coming. There are always other things that could be more pressing. Um, but coming and spending a couple of hours tonight uh, I think is quite, quite uh, impressive. So now I'll turn it over to Father Barrett. We actually have five minutes for two questions. I mean, we said we can't leave them, we can't hold them after 10 p.m., but uh, after 9 p.m., but uh, 
if we have a few more minutes, we can. Does anybody want to ask a question to our panel? question for Matt, how do you include spirituality in a very pluralistic, multi-faith society? How does that work? <laughs> I don't have an answer to that. <laughs> uh, that's the kind of thing that would keep me awake at night. Um, it, I, I think that kind of gets at what I was talking about in terms of keeping things in their proper order. Uh, we're losing connectedness with each other. We're also losing connectedness with God, which I think is where that really begins. That sense of, am I on an island? Am I just a rugged individual? Or am I someone who's made for something greater and made for community? And I think that, that comes out of, I think, a basic, we can call it a faith understanding, but a relationship that begins with God. Um, how you, how you bring others to that or help those along, I mean, that, that's a, an extremely complex question because each one of those relationships is unique and individual. Um, but I think that, I don't know if that kind of gets to what you were, were talking about, but I, I think we're falling into ourselves, we're collapsing into ourselves is what we're doing. And, and we're failing to recognize that we're not just sociable, but we are social, and I think that that's reflected in our relationship with God and others. Well, to me, what this evokes is, is, is respect, and it is respecting everybody's right to pray to whoever they want to pray to, however they want to pray to, and that, you know, recognizing and respecting what's in, what's of paramount importance to you may not be of paramount importance to the person next to you. I, I think that I think we've got a long way to go on that. Okay, we have a question from one of our Montana Tech students. Um, this one's for Mr. McCumber specifically. Um, so, since you're involved with like the news. How do you suggest newspapers or other news sources be politically civil and manage sales? Because when you look at the bottom line versus what you're trying to do, it's two separate answers, it seems like. Good question. Yeah. It is a good question. I'm, first thing is that I think that in terms of keeping an eye on sales, my business model at the Montana Standard is far, far different from the business model of uh, MSNBC or Fox News. You know, if, if you're setting out to, to uh, appeal to one group of people, um, you don't really care so much about civility, perhaps. Um, but if you're, if you're trying to serve a community, trying to play a role inside uh, a community, trying to trying to be a paper uh, that has appeal and some standing within all aspects and all parts of the community, then you really, I think it's a different, it's a different model. And I, I think that the more we can, we can be civil in our approach, the more we can offer a, a, a wide range of views and respect those views, the better off we're gonna be as a newspaper but also, as the community is better off, we're better off. 
And so, uh, community newspaper, and that's why I'm doing what I'm doing now is because it's my favorite part of the part of the media spectrum. Um, it's just we have a we have a different role. Anybody else in the panel want to add something on media? Um, when Dr. Ray said, is there some signs uh, that can allow us to hope, and even Karen mentioned that, well, one sign that gives me hope is your presence here today. I mean, the fact that you came on a Tuesday evening and to spend two hours with us thinking pretty deeply about a difficult subject, potentially divisive subject, to me it's an enormous encouragement, and I give you a lot of credit and Dr. Ray and I in this panel are very, very grateful for your presence. So thank you very, very much for coming this evening. I also want to thank Shanin. She is uh, campus, uh, uh, the Catholic Campus Ministry Director here at Montana Tech, and she has a, a great, great uh, rapport with our students. She has a, uh, a, uh, a Bible study every uh, Wednesday morning very, very early, and, and uh, uh, so uh, thank you for your help in organizing this. I want to thank Montana Tech for giving us this uh, beautiful auditorium uh, where it's wonderful to have a conversation. And, uh, and I cannot tell you how grateful I am. Dr. Ray and I are grateful for our amazing panel. I mean, they all have very different perspective. But they brought a lot of depth and wisdom tonight, and I learned a lot from your answers. So thank you to the panel. Very, very much. So Catholic Campus Ministry is going to continue in the future to partner with different groups at Montana Tech and our next event is going to be called When the Blue Death Plagued Montana, the influenza pandemic of 1918. And it's going to be, we're going to have a, a, an infectious disease specialist who is going to explain to us why is it that it was the young people that died during that, that terrible, terrible tragedy that affected so badly and if it could happen again we're going to go into that into the science of influenza I'm going to talk about the chronicle how is it lived by the people of Buden and Montana their letters their testimonies uh, their witnesses what what they experienced and it's absolutely heartbreaking it's a it's a drama that that tears your heart when you read it uh, because it was filled with grief grief but it was filled with terror people were terrified of getting sick and then we're going to have a ceremony because the first place they closed during the great influenza pandemic in Butte were the churches and so people couldn't say goodbye and you know how big Irish are in, 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 uh, in Irish wakes they were not able to do that those were very very lonely lonesome times and so we're going to honor all the people that died that day uh, in a very respectful and loving way and I would be interested, do you know which was the, the last place that they closed for where public could gather? Mars. You see how hard it is? <laughs> That's a town with a sense of priority, you know? <laughs> Thank you for coming. We have a reception for you outside.